Reverse shells are a key tool hackers use to control computers remotely. The goal of this video is to break them down and make them so simple for you that by the end you have an understanding strong enough you can start using them with confidence right away for CTS, penetration tests or other ethical activities. The video will be separated into three different parts. We will begin with some theory, followed by a practical demo, and finally we will create a simple reverse shell from scratch with Python. Ok, so what is a reverse shell? First, let's look at what is a shell. A shell is a program that allows you to interact with your operating system through a command line interface or scripts. Imagine it as a protective cover around the core of your computer, giving you controlled access to its features. If this doesn't make too much sense, here are some examples of shells that will hopefully make it more clear to you. On Windows, two very well known shells are Command Prompt and PowerShell. On Linux, we have Zshell, Bash, SH, and of course a lot more. Now that we know what a shell is, what is a reverse shell? Simply put, it's a program that connects back to another program controlled by an attacker. Once the connection is established, the attacker gets a remote shell on the victim's computer, allowing them to run commands as if they were sitting right in front of it. Ok, so there are two key things to understand here how the connection happens and what these programs actually do. In other words, we'll explore how reverse shells work at the network level and the application level. For the connection to happen, the victim and the attacker machines need to be connected in some way. This might seem obvious, but it's crucial to point out because some people forget that in order to remotely control another computer, both machines need to actually be connected to the same network. That could be a local area network, for example your home network, or the internet. And yes, this means it is completely possible for an attacker to control a PC from the other side of the planet if both machines are connected to the internet. Ok, we have the connection. Now what does the reverse shell program do when run on the victim's computer? First, it connects to the listener that is running on the attacker's computer. Then, it receives a command from the attacker. It executes the command locally on the victim's computer. Then it captures the output of the executed command. It sends the output back to the attacker. And then it repeats. That is basically all there is to it. Now let's see it in action. For the demo I have two virtual machines. One victim Windows machine and the attacker Kali machine. I have run them with VirtualBox and to ensure that they are connected, I have put them in the same NAT network. To verify the connectivity, we can use the ping command. We first need to find out the IP address of our attacker machine with this command here. We can see it is 10.0.2.15 and now we can go to the victim machine and try to ping this address. As we can see, we have replies, which means the machines are able to speak to each other. Now we can focus on the reverse shell itself. First, we need to set up a listener on the attacker machine that will catch the reverse shell when it sends a connection. We can do this with the netcat tool. We type nc, we specify these flags, and we choose a port on which netcat will listen. You can imagine a port as the network address at which Netcat will listen so that other applications will know where it lives. It lives at port 1111 on host 10.0.2.15. Now our attacker machine is ready to receive the connection. We just need to execute a reverse shell on the victim computer. Reverse shells, like any other program, are written in a scripting or programming language. For this demo, we will use a PowerShell reverse shell because PowerShell is the native scripting language for Windows. I have now opened a browser on the victim machine and I will search for PowerShell reverse shell. I'll open the first one. And here we have this code for a reverse shell written in PowerShell. We can copy it and we can open a notepad for example where we need to set the correct address of our attacker machine over here. 
we have to first input the IP address of our attacker machine, which was 10.0.215, and then the port, which was 1111. Here I have the machines side by side again. Our code is ready. We can open PowerShell and we can run it. As you can see, we have a small problem. The antivirus has uh, detected this reverse shell, so we need to quickly turn off uh, Windows Defender on this uh, virtual machine. Now we can run it again. And as we can see on the attacker machine, something just popped up and now we have a reverse shell on the victim computer. We basically have full control and we can do whatever we want. To show you, I will create a quick file on the desktop over here. We are now in the desktop directory and I'll just create a simple file. And there it is. It just popped up on the other machine. As you just saw, setting up and catching a reverse show is surprisingly simple, as long as you have access to the victim's PC. But you're probably wondering, how do I get this program onto the victim's computer if I don't have access in the first place? That's an excellent question. The answer lies in finding a vulnerability in the victim system that allows you to execute code remotely, also known as an RC vulnerability. Discovering such vulnerability is a complex process and varies with each situation, which we won't dive into today. Our focus is on reverse shells, tools that you can use once you've already found a way to execute code remotely, just like in this demo where we had physical access to the machine. Here comes the most interesting part. If you have never tried creating a reverse show, I encourage you to give it a go before continuing with the video. Creating it yourself will definitely take your understanding to the next level. Ok, let's open VS Code and get started. I have actually split the screen with the VS Code on the left and the terminal on the right. You will see why I did this in a moment. Let's start with a shebang. I'll import the socket library which we are going to use to create the connection. Next, I'm going to declare two variables for the attacker IP address and the attacker port. For experimentation purposes, we are going to use localhost as the attacker machine. So the attacker machine will be the same as the victim. And the attacker will actually be this terminal here. Now I will create a socket object which will be used to control the connection. This syntax right here I found in the Python documentation. Now we can initiate the actual connection to the attacker machine, like this. And here we can actually test it out. I'm going to set up a listener on the right side. I'm going to save this script, open a terminal. And I'm going to run our program. And as you can see, there was a connection initiated by our program to Netcat and Netcat was able to catch it but it closed immediately because we haven't yet defined what data we want to send or receive via this socket. So that is exactly what we are going to do now. We are going to receive the data that the attacker sent us over the socket, which is the command they want to execute. We can do it with the receive function, which takes the number of bytes as a parameter. This means we are going to receive a command that is up to 124 characters long, which is pretty long and should be good enough for most if not all commands. So the command that the attacker wants to execute should be in this variable now. Let's test it by printing the variable. I'm going to save the script, I'm going to run netcat, and I'm going to run our reverse shell program. As you can see, this time Netcat doesn't immediately close, but it hangs. It is waiting for us to send data that it is going to receive with this function. So let's send something. As you can see, as soon as we send something, Netcat closed and we got our data right here. We successfully received the command and the next step is to execute the command and capture its output. We can do this with another Python library called subprocess. Now we are going to use the run function, which will look something like this. Here we pass our command, let me zoom out a bit. 
here we pass our command and we pass some additional flags over here. So now our command should be executed and the result of the command should be in this variable right here. Let's test it by printing the result variable instead of the command variable. I'm going to save the script, I'm going to run netcat again and our program again. Now if I input a, an actual valid command and press enter, we can see that we received our output right here. It is in the std out property of the object. So to make it more clear, we can print result.std out. I will save, I will run netcat and I will run our virtual program. I'll input the command again. And now we can see that uh, we successfully executed the command and uh, displayed it right here. Now currently the commands that are run are displayed on the victim's machine, but we don't want that. We want to send this output over to the attacker so the attacker can see it. For this we can use the send function of our connection object. I'll remove this print statement and I'll use the following code. Here we again have result.std out and we are just encoding it so that we can send it over the socket. I'm going to save again, run netcat and run our program. Okay, now let's uh, run again who am I for example and as you can see this time we successfully executed the command on this site and we send it over here where it was displayed. So now our virtual is basically functioning. The only thing is it only executes one command and then exits. How can we fix that? We can simply add an infinite loop right here and run these uh, three commands as much times as the attacker wants. So let's save, run netcat, run our command and uh, let's try it. There we go. As you can see, it is basically like a reverse shell. We can make it a bit prettier for the attacker by displaying uh, the dollar sign, just like this one right here and this one right here, so that the attacker knows that it is actually a shell that he's looking at. We can do this by sending a dollar sign before we wait for the command, so right here. We are going to send just one dollar sign and one space character. Let's try it. As you can see now it is a bit more understandable that this is a shell and we can just use it the same way. Our little project is now complete. By the way, this is definitely not the only way to create a reverse shell. In fact, this one has some flaws. Let me know in the comments if you have figured out what they are. In any case, I encourage you to experiment more. If you have found a flaw in our program, search a way to fix it. Tinkering and trying out things will teach you a lot and is basically what hacking really is. This concludes our journey with reverse shells for now. Check out this video next to find out how to crack password hashes with Hashcat. Thank you.